Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Fatih. Um, there's a lot to chew on here, a lot, to, a lot of different issues to explore. Uh, let me just kick off with one question to both of our panelists, and then we will open it up uh, to all of you. Um, I, I do have a couple of different questions, and I, um, but l let me start off with this one. Um, Fatih, you uh, have made a case, a very strong case, that you know, the revolution is unfinished. Tunisians are unsatisfied with a lot of the results. I think that's safe to say from Nancy's presentation as well and personal experiences that the same is true uh, in Egypt. Um, so we obviously have unfinished revolutions. Um, I described it at the beginning as a consolidation phase, but maybe to a certain extent it's a pre-revolutionary phase uh, in some senses. Um, if these questions aren't addressed, if the democratic transitions are seen to be failing and the old orders uh, begin to reconsolidate their own power, um, what is going to happen next in both of these countries? In Egypt, we have heard uh, repeatedly that it might come to a second revolution, a second wave of street demonstrations. Uh, and in Tunisia, uh, we may be looking uh, at, at the need for the, for the same thing. Uh, so how will – what is essentially the future of political activism in both of your countries, and how is it going to come into play uh, to correct revolutions that appear in many ways to be uh, seriously off course? Why don't we start with Nancy? Right. Well, this is the million-dollar question. <laughs> well, um, I uh – I usually don't, don't, don't favor the expression second revolution or second uprising because the first one is not finished or maybe have not started yet. You know, I mean, as, as you saw from my own perspective, is that everything we saw is just a continuation of a trend and uh, we, we, we've, we've seen before, but just on a bigger scale and caught more attention and it was highlighted by the dramatic fall down by Mubarak. Uh, uh, and I see that at the same time it has never ended and there was not a moment that there isn't a single Friday in Egypt that there was no protest. Uh, there isn't a single week in Egypt that there was uh, 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 things going back to normal and business as usual. In order to see uh, or, or, or look for uh, solutions and support and how we don't go backwards to square one or even worse than before. We should see. We should look at all the efforts that has been made by the authorities in Egypt to reverse the situation and just act opposite to this. What they did is, first of all, fomenting fear through the media and uh, through the, all the tools uh, that the government had about uh, our economy going backwards and we're going to be starving very soon and that security is going is, is a major issue. Second, having uh, an, uh, an ineffective uh, weak cabinets and, and weak governments in, in place. Uh, third, having um, uh, political parties that are very weak and unestablished and the only political force that is organized, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, are have been, since the revolution, picking their battles with, uh, with everything that's happening, trying always to appease the SCAF and never challenging them, except when there is something really, really serious at stake on the personal, very short term level, but never something that is for the sake of the long term transition of Egypt. And finally, fighting and cracking down on NGOs and civil society organizations in Egypt because they are very, they are seen as the the, the main uh, watchdog and the main effective force that can hold the whoever comes to power accountable and uh, and put them into question and highlight the the the, the corrupt and and uh, and the failings of uh, whoever is in authority and finally having a, a restricted media and controlled by the state so all these uh, efforts that's been done by the authorities since the 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 the, the revolution 
uh, are exactly what we should be working against. What we should be working is to liberating and, and uh, the, the media and having an independent and free media. And we should work on mainly an independent judiciary because this is the only way that we can have a long-term sustainable change in the country. Having a uh, moving, basically, what we are all wanting to see is moving in Egypt from the culture of impunity to the culture of rule of law. And, uh, and third, supporting activists and civil society organizations. And this can only happen by providing them by resources, and when I say resources, we're, we're, we're talking about financial resources and technical resources, transfer of knowledge in communication, raising their skills, and building the capacity of those organizations to be um, resilient and effective organization. This cannot happen under the current condition, and this is what this is why Freedom House decided to go and. Uh, and open an office in Egypt and have a real res representation. They are obvious and transparent, working mainly in, as, as, as it has been working all the time through local partners, because the aim is not just we do the work as Freedom House for Egyptians, no, but help Egyptians do it for themselves, basically, if we can put it in very, very simple language. It's strengthening their capacities to have sustainable and effective means to, to do that, but in order for, for civil society in Egypt to be vibrant and effective and support the transition and watch over the transition and hold those in power accountable of their behavior and their attitude throughout the transition and the policies they make, they we have to have an environment that is con conducive for that. First, we have to have the right laws. I and mean, we're not saying that Egypt should have an influx of money fall over, falling over the country without any accountability, but we have to have governing <coughs> laws that just regulate the activities of civil society, but at the same time, give them the freedom that allows them to, to work effecti effectively. Second, we have to be able to provide them with the, the right financial resources and the funds in order to be able to do that. Do we want civil society in Egypt to be always dependent on foreign resources? No, the answer is definitely no. I would like to see Egypt totally free of aid, completely independent. But how can that happen when uh, civil society in Egypt is criminalized, the work of uh, of rights and democracy groups is defamed. Which business, local businessmen in Egypt would dare to support these con these organizations when this is how they are projected and perceived and criminalized by the government? So until that happens, we do need foreign funding. We do need the support of foreign organizations. And it's not just about money and it's not just about funding, but also the, the, the exchange of experience, the transfer of knowledge and understanding how did it happen in the rest of the world and how can we benefit from it locally I mean it's I don't think we are in in, in, in the age where we can operate in isolation from the rest of the world well basically all the efforts that I've been talking about of reversing the revolution is trying to re-isolate Egypt from the rest of the world and cutting it away from the international attention, cutting it away from the transparency and the accountability mechanisms that can make this country uh, survive. One thing that has been that I have forgot to, to mention in, in, in my presentation is that the biggest failure that I've seen throughout the revolution and with all the efforts and yes, we are perplexed, we are learning, it's, it's a new experience for, for us. But one thing that I did not see, which was very important, is that I did not see one serious attempt at creating accountability mechanisms or accountability bodies in the country that you can have the best uh, cabinet that can ever come. You can have the best parliamentary members that can ever come in Egypt, but without a, a mechanism for accountability, all this will fail miserably very quickly. So I think this is the most important that we also need to focus on. Thank you, Fatih. 
Yeah, people are unsatisfied, and I think that's the greatest thing about the Tunisian revolution and the Egyptian revolution. And I think people are always unsatisfied, and, and that's how we can guarantee we keep our uh, democracy. But um, I always say I'm optimistic about the Tunisian revolution, but I sound so pessimistic. Uh, I, I really uh, am not pessimistic. I am extremely optimistic for, because there are people like Nancy who are working, because there are people like you who come to this present public presentation and want to learn. I'm sure they can do something from their uh, side. And, and this is a, a direct answer to a Charles' question, which is I think is a trap question, but I'm going to try to answer it anyway. Um, well, power, by nature, Michel Foucault, uh, Foucault says, it is by nature uh, meant to be abused. And I think people, um, uh, unsatisfied people, uh, uh, guarantee that this uh, power is balanced. In Tunisia, we are in the process of writing a con constitution. That is one of our guarantees. And now the whole fight is to get a democratic constitution um, we hear a lot of discussions in Tunisia about the constitution. For three months, this newly elected government delayed uh, starting the drafting of, uh, obviously of the constitution. And uh, three months later, we decided to keep the first article uh, of our 50, uh, 1959 constitution instead of inserting the Sharia law. I think that was, uh, um, that was a success of the democratic um, uh, forces in uh, Tunisia. People are unsatisfied, yes, and we want them unsatisfied, and we will be always unsatisfied, and I think even in democracies such as, such as in the US, people are unsatisfied, but there are levels of unsatisfaction. The level in, in Egypt is extremely worrisome. Le the level in Tunisia, I think it's it's hitting the benchmark, you know, um, of a, a country that went through a revolution, of a new government, that never experienced democracy, don't know how to do democracy. So we are learning, and Tunisian people are learning. But I think civil society is learning way quicker than the government. So these safeguards and what needs to be done, obviously, number one is the constitution. Number two is working with civil society as international organization. We need to build their capacity to teach them new skills, that uh, that that was impossible to teach during the Ben Ali era. So it's like a learning process, and it will take time. And I think it's really foolish to think that a year after the revolution, we will have a democratic country. Because if the revolution in Tunisia and Egypt, and especially in Tunisia, happened in the streets, but I think we need a revolution inside here in the mines. And that's the real revolution, and that's what will build a real uh, democracy. I think that would be my answer to your question. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open it up to questions uh, now. Um, I would just ask you to stand. We have a microphone who will, that will be available for you. Please identify yourselves. Keep your questions pretty succinct. And uh, we'll take it from there. OK. There we go. Ala Ghazala, uh, a journalist, uh, originally from Iraq, but living now in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, as you uh, presented, uh, uh, the, uh, if you look back to the uh, Arab uprising that uh, took place uh, in the course of the last year, you'll find out that it's uh, been started by uh, underprivileged people and youth who happen to have the tools, the modern tools for, of communication, cell phones, internet, and other ways. But gradually, it has been confiscated by relig religious parties. In the beginning, uh, you know, in a hid hidden way, but gradually it showed. I didn't see that our speakers emphasized enough on the role of the religious parties and what uh, their expectation for the future. Are these uh, sentiments, religious sentiments, going to take over? Uh, for example, writing the constitution in uh, in Tunisia, or uh, uh, fueling the uh, sectarian strife in some countries like uh, Bahrain, uh, Syria, or even Egypt. So, would you like? Uh, would you please explain that to us? Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, the, 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 the revolution, as we know it, uh, on uh, December 17th was started by unprivileged, uh, um, by unprivileged uh, category of the Tunisian um, society. But let's not forget that before that, there was a lot of work that has been done also by other people. Mm -hmm. Since the Bourguiba era, Tunisian people have been uprising in many, many instances. And interestingly enough, it always happened in January. We have January 78, January 84, January 2008, where mm -hmm. I personally believe that's going to happen. But you know what? The international media did not pay attention. Other countries in the world, and you all know about the WikiLeaks, you know, uh, Tunisia, uh, American ambassador in Tunis, you know, uh, feed to the US, uh, did not take any, uh, get any attention. And that's why that revolution was uh, basically um, smothered and killed, you know. This one, it did not get any uh, coverage in international media until at the very end, Tunisian people did the, do this by themselves. Maybe the, the, last, the last part was covered and there was some pressure, but, uh, and this actually ties even to the previous question that Charles asked, uh, that to international media need to do their work and international organizations do need to, uh, to do their work and it does not, we do not need 270 dead people before we give any uh, appraisal uh, attention or any kind of protest. Um, the, the, uh, social media magnified what happened and brought it to the world, that's true. Um, and it was a full uh, revolution by different categories uh, of the Tunisian. Definitely, um, and privileged people are still holding the, uh, the bar very high for the government now. They go protest and they're doing great work and they are mastering uh, new medias more than uh, anybody else probably. Um, I'm not sure about the question about the religious parties, but I'm going to try to uh, answer it anyway. Um, I think we have, <coughs> Tunisia is a Muslim country. We have no problem with Islam. We have problems with curtailing liberties. We have problem with... Uh, um, undermining uh, human rights, that is the problem. But with the religion, we have no religion. Tunisia, we have uh, Jewish people that live in Tunisia, we have Christians, and we have uh, Muslims, a majority of Muslims. And uh, democracy is really preserving the rights of minorities, not the rights of the majority. And um, obviously, um, some religions, and in Islam too, we know that women's rights might not be uh, might not be as preserved as Tunisian people wish to. Tunisian people wish to keep our uh, uh, making polygam polygamy illegal, and we want to keep that. We want to have our women work and participate equally to men, be in decision uh, making positions. And the, the project that's presented by uh, some Islamist factions, I'm not saying all of them, does not really meet those high standards that Tunisian people are expecting. And uh, the constitution, I mean, we'll see how democracy plays out. But uh, in our constitution, obviously the first uh, fight uh, was won by liberals, by people who are definitely Muslim, but are also want to preserve our Tunisian specificity and uh, hold uh, human rights uh, standards as uh, agreed upon by Tunisian people. Okay, thank you. Um, right over here. Thank you for your presentation today. I'm Matthew Lackenbach with Legacy International. And we currently have 11 fellows here in Washington from Egypt, Morocco, Kuwait, and Oman, and they're serving congressional fellowships and learning about the democratic process and how citizens participate in our government, which, of course, is imperfect. Um, but one of the things they're seeing is the role of institutional safeguards, checks and balances, as ensured by the Constitution and our laws, which you briefly spoke about. 
But the other thing that they're learning about is personal empowerment and that if there's going to be change, they're the ones that need to implement it. So I'm wondering if maybe you can both talk a little bit about the intersection between personal change and personal empowerment and the shifts in consciousness that are taking place and the institutional safeguards and if you, th you see an active dialogue taking place along those lines. Okay, um, I'm just going to answer your question, but just to touch upon the, 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 the previous question about the role of uh, um, religious parties and, and, and how they're acting and behavior, behaving in the political scene in Egypt. And uh, I, I just recall now, uh, at the time when I was working on uh, uh, the, the issues of the Middle East and, and a Lebanese friend at the time when they were trying to um, get uh, Hezbollah uh, be uh, like a, a recognized uh, political party. And uh, he said well, that's only possible when we can uh, separate the Hezbollah from Allah. So uh, this is... <laughs> So, so, so this is basically uh, what is going on in Egypt. Uh, I mean, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. We, we, I mean, you cannot come and pretend, or or other religious group pretend that they are just going to be just as any other uh, political party. Because I mean, this is their flavor. This is the robe they are wearing and the beard that they have. Uh, and at the same time, we cannot discredit them just because they have this. But what will will really make the difference here is again is is having a culture of rule of law that will govern the rights of those people who are worrisome of all the consequences that is going to happen when well an extreme religious uh, party would come to power or an extreme uh, secular atheist party that would prohibit people from going to mosques for example I mean this is what we want to establish I mean it's just like again moving away from the, the culture of impunity and to go to the rule of law and this is why I mean if there is one battle I would pick that we should fight for for Egypt is the independence of judiciary and um, um, and just to say, I mean, this was very clear from how the Egyptian authorities dealt with every sectarian problem that we had in the past 16 months. They dealt, it, dealt with it with exceptional committees that they formed. They did not deal with it through law. And I think this was deliberate. I think this was, uh, was not something that is, uh, uh, was just happened by coincidence because I mean they wanted to maintain that it is always in the hand of those on power is to make or break the the peace and, and, and security in the country and this is why if you would just want to allow democracy well here is what you get so so that's the problem and, and, and this is why this is failing and, and people are disappointed and uh, and basically, if you look at the behavior of the Muslim Brotherhood now, I would see in them, they're the, uh, they're the NDP with beards. I mean, basically, I mean, just acting in the same way, behaving in the same docile way to the, 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 the higher power of the SCAF, and at the same time failing the demands of the Egyptian society. Nothing is different. This is why I'm saying, I mean, this is why I see is like people are amazed by the Egyptian revolution, but I do I feel actually to see what is exceptional there, except a continuation of trends that we have been seeing in the past. Um, as for, for personal empowerment, I can't think of a better example of the example of Samira Ibrahim. It is a very small story, but it tells a lot and is like where and how we can break away from the norm, where we can move from the orthodox to the heterodox to the real change, a shift. There's like the difference between reform and shift. And this can only happen with support of a society that can... The, the idea about the the, the, the the story of Samira Ibrahim is that she challenged the social the rigid social structures that we are living in the the patriarchal society that we are living in she challenged all that everything else that was happening it just are it was happening within that same very rigid social structure within same patriarchal society I was always appalled when when the revolution happened I was still in the UK and I was watching the TV shows and and even seeing the language of how 
uh, how even the TV presenters in the talk show talking to the youth of Egypt in a very patronizing way is like, oh, you're so clever, you cleaned the, 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 the square after you did it in a very patronizing way and saying, well, you did the revolution, that's very good, go sit at home and we're going to take care of the rest. And there is nothing that has changed. Uh, I mean, I don't see any member of the current uh, part, uh, cabinet that is uh, under 70 years or, or, I mean, the youngest maybe a, a bit over 60. Uh, and this cannot happen. I mean, like if personal empowerment cannot happen with the rest of the society are looking down upon those uh, young people among the w about the woman and and everyone who was marginalized basically and this is why I see this as a continuation of a trend I mean the youth with mar were marginalized the women were marginalized the poor were marginalized the labor and their rights were marginalized and they continue to be and the religious minority were marginalized and they continue continuing to be so in order to break away from that and have personal empowerment that you're talking about we need support from from outside, I mean, like we are trying to struggle from within, but we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it without international support and transfer of knowledge and transfer and, and all the resources that we can use for that. Mm -hmm. I want to just uh, tell you about this um, uh, caricature that was uh, published in Tunisian media and um, I'm going to get to the personal empowerment part after that. So they say that Nahda wants to make a Turkey out of Tunisia and Kurds out of Tunisians. Tunisians refuse to be Kurds in their own country. And um, unfortunately personal empowerment it, it's, it is happening. It is happening through social media. It's, uh, people fear really, I mean, there is a hype in Tunisia. We're still living that revolutionary part and people don't really, uh, are not scared of tear gas and, uh, or batons or, or like imprisonment because they know that people are watching, as Nancy was saying, because we know that they will not stay there forever, even though they shouldn't be there in the first uh, place. Personal empowerment. And especially, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure if I, this will answer your question exactly, but it's coming by a reaction. I told you earlier about this uh, person that is uh, allegedly uh, a Salafist, uh, took down our uh, Tunisian flag. A, a, a lady, her name is Khawla, you know, she's a student, she jumped, took the flag and she put it back. And she was received first by civil society, all civil society. And then the government reacted and they received her and gave her... Um, you know, um, whatever that you call it, you know, uh, kind of a reward or something like that. Um, so it is by reaction. However, uh, personal empowerment is happening every day in Tunisia, I think. When, and especially I want to talk about women and personal emp empowerment for women. Women today feel that their liberties, their freedoms are uh, seriously under threat. Uh, there is nothing serious than uh, some people that are allegedly uh, Islamists go into buses in early in the morning to hard-working women and tell them if you stayed at home maybe it's better. It's it's uh, very uh, I think the, the the women of Tunisia are strong and they did build the country. Men did not. Men were in positions of power but women built uh, the country and they are sustaining now the, the, the revolution. Um, I think that's, yeah, so if there is a real empowerment happening in the country, it's definitely with uh, women and, uh, and n nobody's empowering them, they're empowering themselves. Civil society, I mean, we are doing what uh, we can do, but, uh, but I think Tunisian people are really empowering themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, look, we have about 20 minutes left, and I'd like to get to as many questions as possible. So from now on, I think I'll, I'll bunch them three at a time, ask the speakers to keep uh, their answers as succinct as possible, and that goes for the questions as well. So let's take three uh, questions in a row. Okay, over there, Courtney, and then in the middle and the back. Thank you. My name is Courtney Raj. I work uh, here at Freedom House and run our Global Freedom of Expression campaign. And I was wondering if you could just touch briefly on the situation 
um, regarding online uh, in Egypt and Tunisia because it seems like they've almost switched positions where Tunisia was very restrictive and repressive before Ben Ali and we're not really sure what happened to all that infrastructure. So what do you think is going on there? And in Egypt, Mubarak was pretty unsophisticated in his use of new media and social media, et cetera, but we've seen that the SCAF is very much more sophisticated in its use of that sort of media. And I'm wondering, we found out that there was a lot of um, surveillance of activists that wasn't really, we weren't aware of before Mubarak. So if you could just touch on that, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Barbara Ween and I work at American University in the master's program in international peace and conflict resolution. And I also work with campuses all over the United States and Canada that are studying peace, nonviolence and social justice. And I offer to them, them to you as an amazing resource and network who want to publicize uh, what you're doing. Uh, first of all, thank you for your courage, for your social courage. I know you've sacrificed a tremendous amount, uh, Nancy, both of you, uh, and um, you've put your children at risk and many other things, so thank you for that. Um, to my colleague at Legacy International, you're looking at personal empowerment up there on the diocese there. Um, I, my question to you is what is the role of the diaspora here in the United States? Um, we do have a significant Egyptian American population and uh, Arab American population. Um, to what extent has Freedom House tapped into them? Uh, can they be a resource for us? Can they be putting pressure uh, to bear from uh, outside? And I know you've spent a good deal of time on the Hill this week, um, but uh, may I just suggest that um, they are probably the last place in the world where we're gonna see change. Um, the, and, uh, uh, you uh, need to tap into an enormous, uh, untapped, significant potential resource, which is the American public. Um, and while you were on trial and in the uh, cage, uh, your brother here, Ahmed Salah, was crisscrossing the United States, speaking to audiences all over the US, and they are hungry, hungry for more information about the revolution. Um, he can share that with you after the program. Uh, but people waited till the wee hours of the night until his plane would land um, to hear more about what's happening in Egypt. So I would urge you to go on speaking tour to talk to the American public. And finally, what is the role of corporate interests? Um, what are the corporations that are supporting uh, the SCARF in, in Egypt? Um, because the American public can move their money out of those corporations. Boycotts, divestments, and sanctions do work and we're doing it all the time, every day now. Uh, so if there's ways we can be bringing pressure to bear on the corporate interests that are supporting the Egyptian military, uh, I'd like to know what those are. Uh, we should be preparing fact sheets, uh, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to be so long-winded. <laughs> Sorry, um, the next question was, I think here in the back, yes, that's the one. Hi, my name is Neda Zohdi. I work with the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, first, for both the panelists, I think it's clear from your presentations that um, establishing effective mechanisms for accountability and transitional justice is a clear priority. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can share any concrete examples of what those might look like, um, either drawing from experiences of other nations or just things that you have faith would, um, would be effective mechanisms. Um, and secondly, specifically for Nancy, um, in the beginning it was mentioned that you previously worked with the international, uh, uh, sorry, with the Ministry of International Cooperation. Um, so I'm just wondering if that personal experience has enlightened the way you um, see the ongoing attack on civil society in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start with the first question, which is the situation um, regarding the um, online activities in both Egypt and Tunisia and how the uh, governments might have sort of switch positions in their uh, capabilities and approach. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't we start with Tunisia? Yeah, I'm going to ex be extremely short on that because in Tunisia, well, um, internet is free and it has been actually thanks to Ben Ali, whether you believe it or not. On January 13th, he opened internet, opened YouTube and Daily Motion, and he thought he's going to get away with it. But uh, obviously he fled the country the following day. After that, 
we do see that, as I said earlier, I don't want to go back to it, there are a lot of trials against online activists. I told you about two activists that are in jail for seven years now. It's seven years, that's, that's, that's uh, atrocious for uh, publishing a picture, basically. Um, we want also uh, uh, a case, a case that uh, has to, um, to um, ban or to stop uh, pornographic websites. Do they agree with it or not? That's uh, another issue, but uh, the case was won by the people who uh, refused this kind of ban of pornographic website. And I think it's, it's a freedom of speech and it's f people are free to, uh, to... So internet is really free in Tunisia, to tell you the truth. However, however, there are a lot of web pages, a lot of websites that are believed to be uh, used against activists and they call for hatred and they call for killing. Uh, and they, uh, they, um, uh, they carry the name of the Nahda. They carry the name of the Nahda and uh, that is extremely uh, bothersome for, uh, for us that the ruling party would, uh, would not take any action against a uh, website that call for hatred and killing of uh, journalists. Um, the, the other question about the mechanism for, uh, for transitional justice, obviously transitional justice, is, it, it happens, it's specific to each country and we are working on this and we are including victims because they are say is extremely important. But so far in Tunisia, I think number one thing is we need to know what happened. We hear bits and pieces here and there, but the archives are not open. The archives of the police are protected, and we have problems with the information law, access to information law, that restricts access to uh, archives. So the mechanisms, I think they're up to the people to, uh, to decide with the help of obviously experts and drawing from other uh, countries' experiences. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy, would you like to address the question on uh, the SCAF and... Uh, its uh, increasing capability to use the online environment to its advantage. And if you wanted to comment also on the transitional justice question, if you had oh. something on that. Well, I was just trying to like answer all questions, maybe not in, 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 in order. Uh, yes, there is a crackdown on, on online activities in Egypt and, and increasing surveillance and ability to track down uh, activists and, and, and bloggers, but, uh, but thanks also for for the transfer of skills and knowledge and support of international supporters out there that are like trying to provide and counter that and, and, and provide mechanisms and ways to, to just evade all these ways of, of surveillance and crackdown. Um, maybe, Barbara, I would uh, answer your question about the diaspora uh, through personal experience with the question of NADA uh, about my experience with international cooperation. Um, just very briefly, and I'm not talking about myself, but just an example of uh, of, of someone who's been living in Egypt and, and then le lived abroad and chose to go back to at, at a time that I thought I can make a difference. I started my career working with the World Bank and the UNDP, and at some point my I, I have always been struggling to find a way or, or, or a niche where I can actually be effective and, and make a difference. And for some... Uh, naive assumption, I thought maybe uh, reforming from within is the answer and that's why uh, I left my job and I, I joined the Ministry of Egyptian Ministry of International Cooperation hoping that I would be part of that reform from within and my role basically was uh, evaluating the impact of foreign aid in, in, in the country and this, is, this was my, my main area of focus. But when you're working in, in this, again, huge bureaucracy with this rigid structure and and that they're surrounded by all those sorts of corruption very few people can uh, can hardly make a difference and just to give you an example when we started the office that we were working on uh, for for the evaluation of foreign aid there were six of us and the six of us are now outside of a i mean left egypt and just to give you an example who they are and what they're doing now, one of them is at Princeton, the other uh, was at Harvard, the other at World Bank, and one at LSE. And the one who returned to Egypt is put behind bar and now is the defendant number 34, which is myself. 
So you see what what the country is doing is just like talking about brain drain and like why people leave the country and if there is an opportunity to come back. And I wasn't the only one who went back to Egypt after the revolution. I finished my PhD and I thought maybe it was time, there is no hope to go back under Mubarak's regime to make any difference. Maybe I'll be effective outside of Egypt. But when the revolution happened, as everyone else thought, it's a new dawn and we can make a difference. And I was not the only one. I was so heartened by many people uh, who decided to return to the country. Uh, very influential, I mean affluent uh, businessmen, Egyptian businessmen, just transferred their funds and decided to go back to Egypt and, and invest in the country with real hope that there is a difference. But when you're faced by an environment like this, when you see that the people who went outside of the country are in these places and they're shining stars, and the ones who come back are put behind bars, I mean, this is the, the, the message that is, is coming across. Uh, the diaspora, yes, they can do a lot, and they can do a lot by being abroad, by being free, by being supportive and representing, representing um, the, the case of Egypt and, and about speaking publicly to the American uh, public, actually, this is something I, I would want to do and I'm not doing it for myself, but I'm doing it and I owe it to the uh, rest of the 14 defendants who remained and was left behind, were left behind in Egypt. And I promised them as I was going out is that I'm going to get the message across even though this may cost me a lot, even though that I speak publicly now may put me at risk, but I've already paid a cost, let's make it worthwhile. Let's, let's people, I was, I was amazed at all the meetings that I had uh, in Congress uh, uh, yesterday and the day before, that people were actually surprised to hear something new. I thought everyone knew that story. I thought everyone knew what we've been through. I thought, I mean, but, because I mean, after after the waiver and after the foreigners have left, the media, the international media, turned its back to us, and we were left behind. So I do owe it to to the 14 people who are left uh, behind to just get the word across, and I hope this would make a difference and and get the raise awareness to the public who, what was going on. And this is not, and just need to underscore, this is not about 14 people behind bars. This is not about the case of NDI, IRR, Freedom House, and Corners at an hour in the center for. Uh, international journalists, this is about the future of civil society in Egypt. And if this case continues that way and those people are prosecuted, it's a clear message to the rest of the world and, and to the people in the region what happens to those organizations. And we've already seen the, the, the ripple effect of what happened when having uh, other organizations having their offices closed in the UAE, and this will continue and, and carry on. So this is not about us, and this is not about just civil society in Egypt, but also the freedom of civil society in the rest of the world. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Let me... Uh Take a couple more questions there and there. We go. Thank you so much for all your work. Uh, my name is Adrienne Doherty. I'm a democracy activist. I would like to ask you about, uh, you've spoken about the psyche of the opposition and those who are in jail right now. I'd like to ask you about um, what is the psyche of those who are coalescing in Egypt and how are they coalescing? Um, and specifically regarding you know, the recent decisions by the U.S. government on military aid and I'm sure that the impact on the psyche of those who are working hard in Egypt. But what, what is it that we can take from that? You've spoken about what's happened to those who've left the country, but if you could speak to those who are there, the leaders of the opposition. Um, specifically, how are they coalescing? Hi, Sean Carberry, NPR. Uh, Nancy, I just want to follow up on the remarks you were just making about the, the trial and the situation uh, in Egypt. Uh, what, what is being done at this point? What can be done to try to influence this? And is there a sort of a plan B approach that you're working on? If this doesn't go well, how are you going to be able to try to operate and achieve some of the goals that you've been talking about? Uh, can I just, I'll just answer the, both questions um, together. Uh, well, actually, the answer is one word, betrayed. I mean, we feel betrayed, uh, not just by uh, the international community. We feel 
betrayed by the by, by the local opposition because we thought that they're going to be more vocal, more supportive, and have more teeth in 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 standing up for not for us for for the future of civil society in Egypt. Yes, there are some people who are struggling or trying to uh, push back at the uh, new the, the horrible draft of the new NGO law and not to get it uh, passed through parliament. Yes, there are attempts, but uh, uh, after, to answer your question, after the, the waiver has been passed for, uh, for the military aid, uh, everything that was going in the right direction and getting this case into a closure went totally backwards. Uh, just to just to give you an idea, when the, the prosecution for this whole case started, it was framed and going to the direction of a case of espionage, really. The questions we were asked under interrogation, yes, we were giving a charge of operating uh, offices without registration and receiving money without license, but the questions and, and, the, and the whole pretext in the media was all going through, going taking this the direction of a case of espionage. And then because of international pressure, and then because of the raising of awareness, and this, because there were Americans and, and, and Germans and different foreigner, uh, foreigners were involved in the case, we, there was a pressure, and this pressure just in a way, took the took this case to the direction of a closure. But once the waiver was passed, and once we felt that the world turned their back to us, we felt all all by ourselves. And now again, we're seeing in court every time we go there, standing in the cage, we find uh, what we call the civil rights lawyers who come just for the even if they come for the for the public, for the show and for the propaganda, coming and trying to reframe the 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 case again to be an espionage case and trying to include Article 77 in the Egyptian law, which means we get life sentences or execution. So, I mean, this is how bad it can go when when, when the international media recedes and, and turns its back to us. This is what happens when the U.S. Uh, uh, decides to just uh, give away, I mean, the, the the military aid without considering the consequences that can happen to us. And as for the, the impression for the Egyptian public, the, the local public, it basically confirmed to them what the, the Egyptian authorities are always propagating through the media, that the West and, and the US don't care less about the democracy and human rights activities. They only care about strategic interest and stability in the country, no matter how this would cost the people who are there or the future of democracy uh, in the country. So, so these are the dire effects of that. What can be done? A lot can be done. International media attention, getting back on track, and then again, keeping the pressure on through like economic pressure. I mean, political. I mean, political diplomacy. I mean, even just about international relations. And, and another important thing is that. The Egyptian government succeeded in framing this uh, issue as a U.S. as a bilateral U.S.-Egyptian issue. It was not. It was also there were many foreigners and many countries involved in, in the case, and it was mainly about international relations. And it, and when we had the support of the 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 people from the EU, when we had support from different countries, the things looked better for us, things look better for it for Egyptian civil society. But I mean because the Egyptian government knows the, the sentiments in, in in the local public and they understand they can play on this xenophobic and, and anti American sentiments and in the the way how the America uh, at the time of Mubarak was always controlling the country. They know how to str strike the right keys. That played really well and unfortunately the way the U.S. handled the, situa the, the whole issue just mainly confirmed what the, the, the fears and the worries and the concerns of the people. And this is why we as the defendants in, in the cage, we felt betrayed. And the Egyptian civil society also felt very betrayed by, by the, the, the response of the international community in general. Okay, thank you. We're going to have to wind up, but I'm going to ask one last question. Um, and that is about um, liberalism and its future uh, in, in the Arab world. Um, we've had the elections now uh, in, in, in both Tunisia and uh, Egypt, which have put uh, Islamist parties into power. 
Uh, and there's the impression out there that the liberalists and the secularists have been sidelined in, in all of this. But if you look beyond that, um, the ideas of liberalism, uh, democracy, uh, um, accountability by the government, and, and so on, have actually triumphed. And you see this in, in, the, in the platforms of and Nahda and the Muslim Brotherhood, what they're saying and the way they're trying to engage the international community. Uh, so my question uh, for you, both of you, very briefly, is how do you see the future of liberalism uh, in the region, um, and how do liberal and secular parties at this point regroup to translate what I would describe as a triumph of their ideas into effective political action and votes uh, at the polls? Hmm. Well, I think um, the, 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 it's a me. I I think the fact that the the Muslim Brotherhood and or the is the Islamic parties took the majority of the parliament was like uh, the real chance for the liberals in a twisted way, because them being the majority and being. They are giving, getting their chance, getting the break finally after being repressed for years and years, and not delivering. This is the only way for the liberals for the next round, really. Not this one. I don't see this going like really anytime soon, going away anytime soon. But for the next round, you see. I mean, the Egyptian public are really, really smart and alert. I mean, yes, they are influenced by the media. They are influenced by the religious background and the culture, and all the the the, the slogans. But at the end of the day, they need bread on their table. And they need someone who delivers, and they need someone who restores security, and they need to send their kids to school without worrying that they will be kidnapped. And when the current majority, the Islamic majority, is not going to deliver on that, given that we're going to have a free and transparent democratic atmosphere, it is the chance of the liberal to organize and 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 rise for the next round as to provide the alternative virgin, and this is the only way I see it happening. Thank you. That's actually a great question, Charles, um, because that is uh, another important question in uh, in Tunisia, especially in Tunisia. Um, for 23 years and before that, the, the, the regime in Tunisia really demonized Islamists. Um, sometimes for a reason, to tell you the truth. They did recur to violence. They did. Um, but after the revolution, li li liberals really shot themselves in the foot because, um, like the actual government using the same old ways of the old regime, they used the same old ways that really port portrayed them to the general public as um, Islamophobes, which they were not. But the message that got across was uh, negative. Uh, and um, I believe uh, that's one of the reasons they did not win the last elections. Um, liberals uh, are very uh, aware of the situation now. And when we talk about majority, it's true that the Islamist party that's ruling now has 37%, but let's not forget that 63% are liberals. So, uh, I mean, mathematically, and I started my presentation with math, I believe in math, I think the majority is 63, you know. But the problem is that it's defragmented, 0.0001% here, 5% there, 3% there. So it is defragmented. And that's why I really like Charles' questions, because there are efforts to regroup. But they, are, they have also some pitfalls and some uh, criticism, because instead of regrouping around ideals and ideas and opinions, now liberals are trying to regroup around leaders. And, uh, and I, I don't think that uh, that can pay off. For The reason is that one of the leaders they're trying to regroup around is uh, uh, worked with Bourguiba and even the Bay and the president. So uh, there is a lot of criticism and people don't want a choice between Islamism or the old uh, regime. So this is uh, a pr problematic uh, in Tunisia. And um, yeah, I think that is uh, uh, problematic. Regrouping, there are obviously uh, uh, many parties that are 
fusing together uh, and that is that can pay off in uh, the next uh, elections but still i think the discourse and the approach and the whole view to uh, islam and uh, religion and uh, and politics needs to be uh, reviewed by the liberals and uh, i don't think we can build a democracy in tunisia if we don't get to a compromise around that Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for their very insightful presentations.